infinite complacency. People went to and fro over the earth about their little affairs, serene in the assurance of their dominion over this small, binning fragment of solar driftwood, which by chance or design, man has inherited out of the dark mystery of time and space. So on this episode of Into the Fray, I welcome on Tim and Eric Vogel, and they are brothers who have been interested in Bigfoot since 1976 with essentially something walking through their backyard that had very big feet. Tim and Eric, welcome on the show. Hi. Thank you. How's it going? Nice to be here. Good to be here. So let's start right there. If you guys don't mind sharing what age you were when this event occurred and the second part would be were you guys even aware of bigfoot prior to this event happening yeah no good question it it was in 76 and it was a a movie we had gone to see it was uh, i believe it was sasquatch the legend of bigfoot and we had walked pretty far you know, back then we were kids shoveling. How old were we? I don't know, it was probably 13, 14, 14, somewhere in there. Yeah, we were teenagers at best, just kids. And and this movie came out, caught our interest because we don't have anything like that around here. And it, it was just a cool thing, you know, but it was nothing more than that. And, and we got down there, went to this movie, checked it out, came back, and it was uneventful. You know, the movie was good and all, but, but you know, we, we walked back in a snowstorm and you know, that was a you know, pretty uneventful long walk. And I guess it was maybe a couple of months later, the, this incident happened. And one day we woke up and went outside in the backyard to play. We had a big apple orchard that abuts the Westfield River that goes into a big park and just a lot of land. And if we get in the backyard and next thing you know, there's these big tracks in our backyard, oh. big foot tracks. And we hadn't heard all of the town hype yet. You know, the the cops being called. We didn't know any of this stuff yet. All we knew was we got these things in our backyard. Hey, Dad, get out of here. What, what, what's this? He's like, I don't know. I have no idea. So yeah, it was crazy. Yeah, I know. I come to find out it was a, you know, there was a Bigfoot. You know, the town started in on a, on a, on a hunt for Bigfoot. And yeah. we had the police, the newspaper, the, you know, anybody. The investigators. Anybody. Back then, there weren't a lot of investigators. I think they had one or two come out from California, one from New York. It was in the paper. It it, it is in the paper, actually. Part of Robinson State Park. Everything back then, back in the 70s, when the river froze, it froze. (laughs) But And you could walk from one side to the other. And that's what this thing did. It, It came up, it came up the river came across, came up near Robinson State Park and then crossed the river, came up over the railroad tracks, through our yard, through our apple orchard, down into our ravine where there was a stream, followed the stream back out, went back across the river again over in the Robinson State Park. Yeah, we were kids, we couldn't go across the river, we were supposed to anyway, and and that was that, so you didn't cross the river. When the investigators had gotten there, they you know meanwhile our backyard is full of reporters and this and that and it's it's like the the hub of every all the stuff that's going on all the investigating and it took place in agawam and in west springfield right Uh, so we went both places and so we ended up with this guy his name i think is i believe his name is lee frank in the paper and we ended up taking him and a handful of other people you know, for a walk through our property and a hike down right. to the river and whatnot, we get down there. And of course they, you know, they took off on across the river and, you know, we left it at that, you know, we walked back to our house and I'll see you later. And and that was about the extent of the story. Nothing really happened. They didn't find it. They didn't, nothing, nothing really happened. It kind of petered out. And then a while later, one of the cops that had started this was a detective now and and he ended up finding out that it was a hoax kid was 16 or 17 years old yeah probably had saw that movie yeah. strapped some feet on his on it or you know some plywood on his feet and off he went yeah he just he was doing it as as a as a joke for the, the young kids around the neighborhood 
he didn't realize it was going to be taken so seriously. Yeah, you know, Bigfoot, <laughs> to answer the second part of your question, Bigfoot wasn't a thing out here on the East Coast. No. Really? Not that we knew of. Nope. No, really hadn't heard anything. That was that. more of a West Coast thing. Yeah. And then it was just ironic that, you know, this Bigfoot thing happened right after we went and saw <laughs> this movie. So, of right. course, you know, at 13, 14 years old, we're like, what? That's, you know, you're like local celebrity hero thing. <laughs> you know, you got this weird thing in your backyard, got all this excitement going on that no one's ever heard about before. Yeah. And that's that's initially what got us kind of <laughs> going on this thing, you know, but we were kids. And, and you know, as soon as, you know, the next week came along, there was some other big thing. And, and you know, we were on to that. You know, so Bigfoot was there. It, it made an impression on us for sure, but it, I don't think it was, well, obviously it's now a lasting impression because here we are later, yeah, here we are but, talking about it. you know, we weren't running around at 13, 14 looking for Bigfoot, you know, maybe yeah. a couple of months after that, you know, we we're still checking it out, but, you know, I mean, the new cycle went and right. so didn't we, I guess, you know, so that was about it, but that's what captivated us. That's what got us going. And 1976. So after all of that, it was just a, a kid who had strapped on a couple of fake big feet. So all of the reports were simply essentially yeah. just that. Hey, I woke up. There's huge tracks in my backyard. So it was none of this. Oh, there's something eight foot tall peeking in my window at night. It, it was there was it no, was always tracks. tracks. Okay. Yeah. And wow. this guy did his that's, how, that's how we actually got into Bigfooting was by a hoax. Yeah. Yeah, this thing was a hoax for sure. You know, you, normally you, that happens at the end, but <laughs> we, we you, I started that way. Yeah, yeah, literally came through the backyard. It was and, great. And this guy had put on probably a couple of miles anyways. Yeah, he was, uh, he was a strong kid. <laughs> you know, it was, you know, it was like snowshoes running through the snow and whatnot. And he did it. He did it for quite a while to kind of baffle everybody. But like I said, you know, it wasn't an East Coast thing. We certainly didn't hear of it, and we lived out in the woods. We were in the Western Mass. This is all in Western Massachusetts, and it's you know my backyard was Mitnick Park, woods. Robinson State Park, Westfield River. It's all woods, you know, similar to where it is right now, you know. So that's kind of what got us into it, though. I love that Inception story because I was taking all these notes to ask about, you know, these other reports and who actually saw it. And there was no it. It was just a, a kid yeah, perpetrating That's a hoax. I, I actually like that. That was a good twist to the story. <laughs> yeah, no, it was. Unfortunately, yeah. yeah, yeah. The kid turned himself in and he said it was just a prank yeah, and was just to, playing to neighborhood and kids. And, and it got a little yeah, he, said, he said well once it got out of control he didn't know what to do he was he was he got scared i think they gave him the plywood cast it was funny plywood things back but he i mean there was a lot of people investigating it it was yeah. it was crazy it was a big thing back then yeah i can just see him putting his hands up like sorry guys i guess i was a little too good at this one my apologies <laughs> yeah, that was no it was good now Tim, and remember this uh -huh. this whole thing is front loaded by the movie showing right. up you know making headlines it made the papers this and that and the other thing so this is actually this you know the motivator for that kid i'm sure right and then of course anyone like you guys said that had seen the movie you're going oh my gosh they're real and they're here i know what that is <laughs> exactly <laughs> kid was actually yeah. uh, very creative i wonder if yes, he's he if he's kept those as you say you know is he has he framed those and put them in a shadow box does he still have that as right. an adult <laughs> right <laughs> really <laughs> in his twisted man cave <laughs> yeah <laughs> uh, yeah i wonder <laughs> yeah and that's another question because uh, obviously you guys have had actual sightings of actual bigfoot not 16 year olds and yeah. in fake track cast but it does make you wonder then because look at the the, the fire that it lit for maybe you and others, it, does that mean that this kid, now an adult, has an interest in Bigfoot? You know, are you in touch with that guy at all or know of him still if, no. if he's into Bigfoot now? No. No, it'd be interesting. No, I could probably do the homework and find out the kid and probably could find out this that's kid. Interesting. But that's interesting. I haven't gone in that direction, really. That would be a good interesting. question. Yeah, I just... But it, I, certainly, I it certainly gets us motivated. You know, uh, we could certainly, that was the seed that was planted. Yeah. Oh, I can you understand know, it, why. It just makes it more believable now for us. Right. You know, 
the incidents that we had that we couldn't, you know, figure out what was going on. We were having these things go on. And, you know, this ended up being the avenue that we believe it is, is the Bigfoot. So, Tim, you are a ranger, right? Is it okay to, to uh, say that? Yeah. Yeah, I'm a ranger. It's what I do full time. Where now, yeah. and this is maybe I'm in, in Massachusetts, in, in the Western Massachusetts. And how long have you been doing that? About 15 years. And prior to now, this is, I guess, another question about prior to inception. That, yeah, Eric was there Bigfoot I, prior to that, or what did you know? Were you already a ranger because you just you love to be outdoors, and then the Bigfoot stuff started? No, we owned a business called Tacoma Mountain Outdoors, Eric and I. And it was an adventure education business. And that was back in 2000, we started that. And, and everything Bigfoot, you know, actually happened really around 2013. But we had an outdoor adventure education business that was, you know, we were outdoors all the time, running school programs. We'd have 80, 80 10th graders out in the White Mountains backpacking or, you know, canoeing on, on the Adirondacks or something like that. It was, it was a good it was a good time. We did it for 15, almost 20 years. Yeah. COVID came, put a kibosh to the whole, you know, outdoor education at schools and all that stuff. And, you know, I was a full-time ranger in the middle, but really the ranger thing had nothing to do with it. It just pays my bills, <laughs> which is cool to live way out here, I guess, you know, but, you know, it's a paycheck and, and I enjoy what we're doing and I, you know, it's, it's a great thing. But I don't know if it had anything to do with me, you know, finding a Bigfoot or seeing a Bigfoot. That was just sheer luck and happenstance and right place, wrong time. <laughs> I don't know. It right. Was, yeah, it was <laughs> quite the experience. Yeah, because we really did spend a lot of time out in the woods all over, you know, backcountry and everything else. And that I think that's why we had the incident when we had it. Yeah. Because we were we've been back there so many times for so many years. So I, I guess our our first real incident with the which we believe was a bigfoot was up in the canoe trip, and right. you know it was with our business, <laughs> and we had been doing school groups and, and scout groups. We take them for a week long, maybe a hundred mile trip, a canoe paddle and portage, and you know and then on to the next one and on to the next one and on to the next one and on to the next one. So it was a summer paddle and portage up in the Adirondacks, some backpacking in between, you know, there's all kind, you know, rock climbing, all kinds of that stuff all, all summer for many, many summers. And we found this one area in particular, really, really cool to paddle in. It was called the St. Regis Wilderness Canoe Area in the Adirondacks up in, up in New York. And it's a, you know, a, a non-motorized boat only. So it's only canoes. And it's just a really, really um, uh, it's a cool place, a real special place, actually. It's, it's just a, you get a good vibe from it, paddling and fishing and it's You're the out. environment, the scenery, everything is just, you know, it's not the big West Mountains. This is the Adirondack Boreal Forest and a lake environment. And, and that's where we were. And that's where we spent most of our summer. And so we decided to go on vacation and <laughs> we ended up going into the Adirondacks and go fish, uh, you know, uh, camping on a canoe trip. And we went to this little place. We won't give the, the place away, but we went up to a spot. And in this particular spot in New York, all the campgrounds in the Adirondacks in this area are sanctioned by the state. In other words, the yeah. Department of Conservation puts a tag up and says, you can camp here. Not there, not there. You'll be arrested or asked to leave. <laughs> But yeah. you can camp here. So if you if you camp in a tagged location, you're good. And and it's really kind of weeded out the riffraff and you know these the satellite campsites and you know right. things like that. Because first off, you're way out there, and and it's it's difficult in this forest in this environment. It's really first off, it gets dark at four o'clock in, in the middle of summer because it's so dark. Yes. I call it the pit bull forest, right? It's it's so it's dense it's and thick and dark. dark. It's just rugged, rugged country up in there. And so we, we get up there, we get to this spot. We have to drag our boat up through the mud and through our portage. And we set up camp and we go and we're, we set up camp and we're going to eat. Yeah, that was the last, that was the last campsite, by the way. Going to eat. At the, we were up on the hill and yeah. we, we, when we set it up, 
came back down. We we got in the canoes and we paddled out. That was windy too. <laughs> it was very windy, but we went out. We were going to catch fish. <laughs> that was the thought. <laughs> that, yeah. It was dinner. We were going fishing yeah. for dinner. We were going fishing. So we're paddling down. Where there's a little island, and there's the shorelines over here, and there's an island, and we're on the right hand side. So we're coming in, and it was it was nice. It kind of cut down the wind. And I had Tim paddle, and I started just fly fishing out there. I had a great time fly fishing. I don't know how we felt about paddling, but I had a okay. good time. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you know, we caught quite a few, and we we it got to the point where it was just we we weren't dinner fishing anymore. We were just fishing for the sake of fishing, having fun. And then he paddles us down into this little this this inlet yeah. headed towards a beaver dam and uh, mm-hmm. as we're going into the beaver dam you, you, a lot of overhanging uh, branches were were on my on the left hand side so i was like wait wait a minute i said uh, i don't know if i want to go underneath there and he goes well i just want to try the 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 dam so i says well he's trying to paddle in and i'm trying to paddle out so i said we we spun the boat around and that's when he got to the around those bushes, and he was able to throw the 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 line over into this into this beaver pond or beaver dam, whatever. Yeah. And he started catching fish over there. Yep. So I, I'm fly fishing now. I have my opportunity. So I'm fly fishing, and I just started I fly fishing, and I put one into the into this beaver pond, and and it's a narrow stream that comes down through the woods. And then there's a bow-shaped beaver dam, probably, I don't know, 25, 50 feet long, maybe. About that. And it's it's bow-shaped, and it goes back to a narrow stream that feeds it. And and it's, you know, up, we're in a canoe, and it's probably head level, so it's probably four feet high yeah. anyway. All and right. and so I'm fishing a boat, and all of a sudden I caught one, and it's a small mouth, and they just break the water, and off they go, and they're swimming and jumping and everything. <laughs> It was making a lot of fun and all the fish, there was quite a few smallies there. So it was, you know, it was pretty exciting. And then we got one up on top. And as I was reeling it back into the boat, that's when everything went off and and the, the screaming and the tree shaking and, and all that happened. It's called so, all, all hell broke loose. Yeah, you ain't kidding. <laughs> so the, 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 these trees start shaking first. And I, I you know, meanwhile, I'm reeling this fish back in and all of a sudden these two trees like they were in a snow globe isolated out of the whole forest and and it was a deciduous tree it had leaves on it i wasn't one of the conifers or one of the pines in there one of the spruces this was a a, maybe a box box alder box something like that around there anyways it was a deciduous tree it had a you know a canopy and and this thing was turned out to be eight or ten inches around and two of these trees started shaking like they were in a snow globe and it was just so so surreal because I mean that, that was it. It was and just it was only trees. 50, 60 <laughs> yards away from where we were sitting. Right. And <laughs> these trees are going so shaking so much that uh sticks are coming out, things like that. And I don't know if they, they're actually falling out of the tree or if they're actually being projected out from so these right. this tree shaking goes out for I don't know, maybe 15, 20 seconds, and then this roaring starts. And the roaring was was loud it was extremely loud it was a roaring screaming cacophony a noise sound of thing kind of uh, for lack crazy. of better words it was a, a, just a really really aggressive roaring and it did not stop and this roaring over time pr- this whole incident took probably 10 15 minutes i didn't have a cell phone we were fishing for dinner we did just we didn't have anything. We were just a couple of rods and, and a, a couple of extra flyers, and that was it. And that, was it. Yeah. that was it. So we're backing out. Now this stuff is so aggressive and shaking and whatnot that it sounds like it at, we have no idea, but we think by by right. from where it started and the sound, and it, it was getting more aggressive, like in the trees and the you know, the stick in the water and stuff like that. And so we backed out further and further and further. And it, literally, we ended up like halfway out in this pond, which was probably now we're a good hundred yards away from this, and it's still loud. Yeah, but it's still loud. when when 
before we get yeah. we got to like 50 yards 60 yeah. yards out you could feel that thing yeah. you could actually feel it against yeah. your body yeah. the 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 depth the, the loudness i say so it's like, being at a ted nugent Kreiser. <laughs> And if you've been blessed to do one of those shows, then you'll know what I'm talking about, that <laughs> reverb. Yeah. You know, it's just blasting. You could feel it. It's like if you really could feel it. Come right into your chest and you could just feel it. And and we're that far out and you could still feel it. Yeah. And we and, just kept going. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, after a while, it was just nuts. And like, we weren't even sure if we were far enough out there. We were we were over halfway and we were still we weren't, we weren't sure if we were far enough. Yeah. It was and crazy. then it just stopped. Yeah. As it fast stopped. as it started, it stopped. Maybe because we had backed up far enough. Who knows? We have no idea. All I know is that this whole stuff went on. It took about 15 minutes for us to get from the dam to the point where it stopped. And it never, I don't actually remember hearing it stop. It just it kept did. screaming. Yep. And, the, and the trees kind of went on and off. Or maybe it didn't stop maybe it just got less aggressive and then it, and then it went again but the whole deal was pretty surreal and it lasted for quite a while quite a while we sat on the other side of the pond yeah. for a good 15 minutes yeah, just kind of listening yeah after it's, it's quiet right and this now it's dead quiet yeah. there's you can't hear anything yeah so we start paddling across the lake and as, as we're get going across i said hey tim he goes yeah i know we're we're camped on that side, a hundred yards away from where this all happened. Maybe two hundred. <laughs> yeah. Same side, same everything. It's just down a little bit. And there we are. It's like, oh my God! There was no, you know, you don't get in your car and go home. There's yeah. none of that. You're in a boat. You're in the middle of the wilderness. It's crazy. And that's your situation. So we made the best of it. We got to camp. We actually didn't eat. We just no. made a big fire. And and stayed up all night with a fire till exhausted and he crashed, I crashed. That was about the extent of it. Oh, you mean that you didn't go right day. right to sleep and have lovely dreams of uh, rainbows <laughs> and butterflies and things after that, guys? <laughs> yeah, yeah we, we've been asked that. We've been asked the question. What, what did you talk about? Uh, yeah, you know, we we never ever yeah. mentioned it. You never said we anything. Yeah, uh, we briefly we knew oh, what happened. We, yeah, we just didn't know how to explain it to each other we're trying to really process that you know we were like well maybe if we don't talk about it, it never happened <laughs> it'll, go <away. laughs> it'll go away you know yeah you know, it, was, it was crazy it was unbelievable yeah, yeah. very now, unnerving having to spend the night there though and now looking back right? it, say that that was your only experience right and it, you didn't ever yeah. actually see one after that looking back if you can just isolate that experience do you wish that it would have stepped out enough so that you could see what was making this horrendous sound or are you a little bit relieved that you didn't i, I absolutely wanted to oh, um, nice. eric made a reference a while ago about the canoe going back and forth he wanted to go one way i wanted to go the other that's exactly <laughs> if this was a cartoon i would have been going into it he was going <laughs> that way and the canoe would have ripped in half <laughs> so that that's that you know that was what i wanted at the moment mm -hmm. i really wanted to go in um, but we were also limited by the beaver dam in front of us. We could only go to that point, and that was that was our limiting factor. Right, and and that's because the the trees were shaking. You know, we weren't really well. That's just kind of weird. But and then the growling and the you know the roaring started, yeah. and that's when it got real. And that's you know eventually we ended up backing out. Yeah, and, when, when you can hear that when you can hear that noise for that length of time, yeah, yeah it's time to go. <laughs> yep, and I've had. You know, multiple bear encounters here in camp at the other camp I worked at as well. Yeah. And you just kind of, they just run away. Typically the black bear in particular, black bear in camp. And, and what I've come across, even in the wild, they just run away. You know, if they wind you, they're gone. They don't want nothing to do with you. That's why, it, that's why it's difficult to hunt a bear. It's, you know, they, they're, they're right on their game. They, they know when you're there, they hear you, they know. And once in a while, when you have, that that scary interaction that's just you had the wind in your favor and the bear didn't and the bear just you guys just walked up into each other and that's how you had the encounter but if they have the wind you're not gonna you're not gonna see that animal you're not gonna see any of them because <laughs> they're all gonna go yeah so guys what about other people in the area during this encounter 
excellent question. We, we actually picked this area because of its remoteness. We picked it midweek. So if people were at work and, and in school, yep, school started and it was late September, late September, 2013. So people were in school, yep. people were in work. So the odds of, of anybody being out there to prank us in particular on that day at that given time would have been astronomical. And, and then if you've ever paddled and portaged in the, the Saranac area or up in the boreal forest up there without a trail, it's rugged. It's it's rough, and that's why we had called it the pit bull forest. You don't you don't just bushwhack through this place. Not, not on purpose. No, <laughs> you know, you bring an an axe or a machete, cut your way out. You make a privy. You know, yeah. you're a couple hundred yards, a couple hundred feet away from camp or your cooking area. You cut your way through. You know, or there's a designated area where you can do that, but you got to go hang your boot, you know, your food and stuff like that. And so. It, it's really, really, really rugged. So I can't imagine anybody wanting to do that on purpose for us. Number one, we were the only ones know, my wife knew where we were camping. We, you know, that was the note left at home. Hey, honey, you know, we're camping here. And if we're not back in a couple of days, you know, 911 or call that forest ranger. And so we always had that, you know, the, the typical backup kind of a thing. And, and we ended up at this place where, there was one campsite on the state campsite that was allowed. Right. Most of your people are going to do what they're told. Most of them are going to be law abiding. And most of them, if you've gotten, if you've gone in there and gotten kicked out by one of the rangers <laughs> because you were in the wrong site, you, you ain't going back. Right. You just ain't going to go. Or one too many people in that site. Yeah. We, we were oversized group and we, we had to beg to stay one time. We had and they will come in yeah. one, two o'clock in the morning, tell you, pack it up. Yeah, Get out. Uh, Where this site was, Shannon, was uh, all by itself on, on this one pond. Yep. And it's the only site on the on the pond. And it was a portage to get to that. And you had to slog it through the muck. It was awful. So it was just not a very. Yeah. I, yeah. I don't see anybody pranking us there. No. Pranking that. that, no. I mean, that if they did. Man, that's a that's an amazing feat. Yeah, <laughs> I would have loved to had this thing popped out. We we often you know talk now, about yeah. it, and you probably know a, a friend who's passed, Wayne Barnes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, we had discussed it many a time, our our story and our talk, and he always likened it to a like a like a Remington, an old charcoal or pencil Remington drawing. You know, Bigfoot coming out of the tree and a couple of canoers, you know, like putting a pack in the thing. We, wow, what a good time we'd have chatting about that. But, but Wayne would be the guy to put it pen to paper for that, something like that. He sure would. He was but, incredible. What a, what a wonderful man he was. Yep. He's super good. Super yeah. good. Good times, good memories. But, but that was the, that was the, you know, the kind of vibe that Wayne had gotten when we had talked about that story. That's how close we were and whatnot. Now that we, had sitting back a number of years and Monday morning quarterback, listen to all these other stories, reports, investigations. You know, we can, I, I don't know, I'm pretty comfortable saying that first off, why were we there? And why did we run into a potential Bigfoot or something there? And my answer, and Eric, <laughs> we were fishing. Yeah. The same reason why they were there. And I think they were tolerant all the way up until I started catching fish into the beaver pond. Yeah. And I think once I nailed that one in the beaver pond, that's when they started going off. And, you know, there's a, there's a, a cast available. It's a hand, it's a hand cast. It's a, it's one of these massive, you know, casts that are out there. It's probably 15 inch mitts, you know, as big as a catcher's mitt, you know, first baseman mitt. And, and I can imagine if there were two of them, there were two trees shaking. So we don't know how many there were or, or anything. All I could tell you is there was two trees shaking and a, and a significant amount of roaring that didn't stop. And, and if it was a Bigfoot or two Bigfoot, then we believe they were fishing. Possibly they started working on one end of the, the stream and just kind of, you know, using their bodies and pushing feet, corralling them towards this beaver pond yeah. that's there now, a natural yeah. trap, basically, yeah. like an old fish trap. And they're using it in their, you know, in their method now. And all of a sudden, these two dudes show up in a canoe and start taking their fish. And they weren't having it. They just weren't having it. And they started yelling and screaming and throwing stuff. And yeah. 
and they won and off we went. Well, and, and you know, and that was the extent of it. To add to that, just to piggyback off of what you said, not only were you encroaching on their, uh, the honey hole with the fishing spot, but the whole reason that you guys chose that spot is for the fact there wasn't a whole lot of people. You said it's midweek. It was during school. You know, it was probably yeah. a little chilly at that point, I would guess, you know, not yeah. the, the most opportune time that people think of camping. Right. And so on top of that, this yeah. Bigfoot is going, wait a second there's not supposed to be any of these hairless things here right now. This is supposed to be like our time. You know what I mean? So the very reason right. that you guys chose that time might be the very reason that you exactly. had the experience. Exactly. I, I completely agree. Yeah. For some reason, our process of our thoughts the same. It was remote. It was yeah. probably going to be alone. And, and that's exactly and that's, what we were looking for. We were looking and the for. fish. Yeah, and we, we nailed it. We didn't want to be around any people at all. Well, you weren't. You were. <laughs> you weren't around people. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. true. Pretty amazing yeah, though encounter. True. I can't imagine having something experience. something scream that long. As you said, you guys are slowly backing away, which I think was the the proper thing to do there. <laughs> Even though I know Tim's like, I'm going oh. towards it, and Eric's like, No, no, no. <laughs> you know if if that had exactly. Have you thought about what might have happened if? you both wanted to pedal towards it or not moved back. Do you think that would, oh, I think bad would've... things could have happened. Do you do? <laughs> no, we, we, I, I think, you know, we say we didn't discuss it, but I think we did, you know, we, we tried to process what it was. And at one point, I think we had mentioned like a, it sounded like a bear battling a mountain lion kind of thing that just didn't stop. It just kind of kept going. Uh, that's what the sound was like. It was just so, Good Lord. I, I really, you know, I say, yeah, I want to go towards it, but who are you? Yeah, yeah. I don't know what I would have done. Yeah, no, <laughs> come I, across yeah, it actually was so thing. mad. If, I think if we had gone towards it, God only knows what would have happened. Yeah. You know, I mean, it wanted us out of there and there was no ifs, ands, or buts. It, it was evident through the vocalization oh, yeah. and what we felt that there was, you were not the, <laughs> you were not welcome. You, yeah, get, get gone. Yeah. Get gone. And it, like you said, it's because it was so remote. They figured that finally, you know, all these visitors are gone. Yeah. They can go and get it. And sure enough, here we come, be bopping in. <laughs> so, okay. yes. So, uh, going off of, let's go off that scenario. Let's go off the scenario you guys didn't back out of there. And either, well, we don't, like you said, we don't know how many there were, one or more. Right. Say they came out and they are, they're beyond pissed. They're going to take it to the next level. Do you think that they, and sometimes these are closing questions, but it's, it's apropos now. So do you think, especially since you guys are out there alone, being the alone uh, humans, yeah. do you think that people that make that decision that they occasionally just take those people or dispatch those people, you know, because they get too pissed or they see an opportunity for, Hey, this is bigger than uh, a fish. Yeah. You're part of the food chain. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, well, we have always said to each other, we are back here so far. We are on the food chain, <laughs> you know? So, I mean, yeah, no, it, that's a good possibility. We, you know, they, Whatever was shaking them trees would have had no problem devouring us. <laughs> yeah. At least that's the way it's that's the way it seemed like. You know, we had gone back the the following year, and we yeah. we looked at those trees. That's Measured how we it. knew how big they were. They were six to eight feet apart, yeah. and they were almost ten inches in diameter. Yeah. And they, I mean, and they were both shaking. It was crazy. But could they have come out <laughs> and and you know? aggressively taken us or something i believe they could or any other there's a lot of missing people out there <laughs> a lot of missing people so it's a, it's very yeah. possible and yet, anything uh, is possible. hasn't been my experience but you know yeah right yeah <laughs> i'm not gonna right. in here you know yeah we've been very fortunate there's a lot of hikers a lot of campers you know a lot of people go missing and there's a lot of reasons not just saying a big oh, right you know i don't think there's a lot of bigfoot number one i think they're few and far between but you know there's probably more apt to be a while you know really it's more apt to be getting lost going off trail and dying of hypothermia and ex you know yeah. exposure stuff like that simple stupid stuff yeah and then you know, something comes across your half dead body or carcass and then they start mauling and eating you, you know? 
But it's usually something like that. You fall, you're messing around on a rock outcrop. Poof, right. you fall, you twist your leg, you know, you're messed up, something like that. Yeah, just walk off trail. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, places like, I don't know, when I was doing guiding in South America, we <laughs> set up a camp and we take a climbing rope, a 200 foot climbing rope and tie it from the center of camp to a tree where the rope <laughs> ended. And that's how you got back and forth to the bathroom. Because if you tried to walk away, Without knowing, you were you were pretty much all done. Yikes! You know, every leaf looks the same out there, and and the same in this boreal forest at night. Forget it. You know, so you know it's pretty. We're, I don't know. It, it's very possible that that stuff could happen. So, what was the next event for you guys? Next event. Okay. Well, do a juvie. We did oh, October out. We did a, no, no, no. I'm fortunate, actually. We've had a, a we've number had quite of quite a few. Things. We did an expedition. When was this? 16? 2016. 16. We were on a, we were on an expedition in 2016. There were about 15, 12, 15 of us. It's a BFRO. Right, BFRO, BFRO. expedition. And we we during this uh, the this four day the, this four day weekend we uh, myself and this other gentleman and his son. We were here at we were here at the the camp here. We were doing it here. And we were in a field, and we were looking through the fleer. Gave it to his son. His son was watching this this mouse run around. So I was talking to his to his father, and we're we're looking across the this this field. And I I looked at him, and, and I'm saying to myself, there shouldn't be a light over here. And this was a couple hundred yards away sitting in, in about 20 feet off the ground and it was a good size ball about beach ball size maybe a little bit smaller and it was like a yellowish color and it, it was just sitting there and i looked over at him he looked at me we both looked back at this thing and we just watched it kind of go up in the air and gone we were like what so we didn't think anything about it we didn't say anything the next day we we, we went out, we checked an area that we were going to previously go. No, no. Prior to that, right. prior to that, prior to that, we had the school teacher. Oh, yeah. The school teacher. This is at a camp. The, this, the school group was come, had come in and spent the day here. And, you know, she wanted to go and talk to the ranger. So somebody got her to go talk to the ranger. And they got me and I had to go talk to the school teacher. And the school teacher says, there's somebody, there's some guy out in the woods yelling at us and the kids are scared. Could, you know, what's going on? You know, is there something out there or is there people in camp? I said, no, you're the only one. So I, I'm, I'm right. kind of thinking out loud. No, you're the only one in camp. So I said, well, I'll take care of it. I said, you guys had announced? She goes, yeah, we're all set. I said, everybody on the bus, you do a head count, all that <laughs> stuff. And, and everybody was good. Off they went. And before she left, she said that this guy was yelling and uh, possibly throwing stuff at the kids. And they were, you know, the kids were responding in kind, yelling, ah, you know, whatever back. And, and that was the extent of it. I had no idea any of this happened until the teacher had told me, until the teacher had told me. Yeah. They got on the bus and left. Eric and I had discussed it, but it really, you know, eh, you know, maybe something out there, but really couldn't tell. Yeah. Then he has his orb thing. Right. So there's, there's this a little setup in there. Yeah. And it's been raining on and off for like four days. So the following day, we go out on this expedition. We went out to a place called Savoy State Forest. Yeah. And we had gone out there and we went and stopped at one spot and it was kind of raining kind of hard and no one wanted to get out. So we said, all right. So we drove to another spot and just enough room just off when everybody pulled off this dirt road, you could park a few cars in there. And about 12 to 15 people got out. A lot, of, mo a lot of people stayed in their cars when now they wish they had gotten out, but we had gotten out and we had walked in, into the woods and we're headed up towards to this place called Balance Rock. And as we're going in, these two gentlemen like to, they like to lag behind. They like to watch the group to see if the group is being watched which is really cool because sometimes they see things or, or hear things that we can't because you're with a group and there's a lot of noise. So this, this father and son went up ahead of us and they have a GoPro. So we're kind of walking up and we're kind of just looking around, listening. 
come, we get to the top to balance rock and we kind of take a break. And we asked this little kid who, or we, we said, who would like to, to make a hollow? And this little kid says, I, I would. So we let him make a hollow. And it immediately right after that, the, the two guys that were behind us came up and says, Hey, we just got whistles back here. At the same time, the father and son, the, the son came back and says, Hey, we just had, we just had claps or, or, or some type of knocking up here in front of us. So we, we were just, we all walked into the woods and we kind of all spread out. So you have like 12, 15 people going in different directions. <clears throat> I think there were three. I think there was one on one to the right, one to the left, and there was one in the middle. We went in, we were in about 30, 40 yards and we we're kind of all spread apart. And I was standing on this little rock and it's, it's kind of misting, kind of, you know, misty rain. Everything is, is wet. And I'm, and I'm, I'm an outdoorsman. So I'm saying, okay, if I want to see something, I'll squat down and I'll look, see if I can see something move. And, and I went to squat down and, I, and I'm looking and all of a sudden this thing tilted and was on an angle. And I said, what is going on? And I went, what? So I stood up and when I stood up, it teeter tottered with me and came up and I went, oh man. And I pointed and as I pointed, there was a guy in between us with a GoPro and there was a gentleman to my far right on a different angle than I was. So I couldn't see him. We come into the same GoPro frame at the exact same time yeah. with our, with our fingers out in front going in the same direction. Yeah. It was unbelievable. And we ran up there. Why we ran up there. I'll never know, <laughs> but we did. New York is running away. <laughs> see, Boy, he's running to it. <laughs> you know, I said, man, so, so we and got this time of season. Yeah, right. So I'm I'm literally looking at this thing. So we get up there and it, it's gone. It's just gone. There's nothing there. And and the two guys that were coming down were they were only 50 yards away, coming down the same road. And we're looking around and everybody says, Hey, did you see it? And John turns around and says, Yeah, I saw, you know. There were two of us, the two that ran up to it. John says, oh, I saw the, I saw the legs move. Yeah. And I turned around and I said, well, I saw the upper half. I said, I teeter-tottered with it back there on the rock. And uh, so we're looking around for, for, for anything. And at the time, there was just so much going on. We, we didn't see anything. So at the time, Tim was teaching a, a fishing class. It's the first time that we really haven't, we've been out Bigfooting and we weren't together. So he never got a chance to see this. So I came back and I said, I said, you have to go with me. I said, you won't believe what happened to me. So I told him the whole story. So we go out there the following day, we, we go walking in and I, I take him to the rock and I said, that's where I saw it. So we walked around we did the whole big foot. Oh, we, yeah, we, I, we, we walked out there. I it said, made one, rain. Yep, go on out to this tree. I said, I'll tell you when to stop. So he goes out there and stops. I, I, I had in my range finder, I range find it to 40 yards. And I said, okay, now get, just lift up your hat and I'll tell you when to stop. So he starts lifting it up. So he's going up and up and he's going more. And I says, yeah, keep going. By the time he stopped, it was almost nine feet tall. Wow. Almost it, almost four feet wide. It was, it was like I was looking at a, it's like I was looking at a sheet of plywood. That's how I can explain it. It was that big. And the two guys that were coming down the road never even saw this thing. And I just, it blew my mind to even think about that. And so we go walking, or so Tim and I go walking up to this, to this tree. The tree is laying down. And right on the other side of this tree, there is where a it standing right where it, it was standing, maybe five or six yards away. Yeah, actually, it was a little further away because Eric saw it yeah. on, in, in a small grove of green striped maple. Yep. And the track that we cast was the one that was the first track away. That was right. about maybe eight, 10 feet. And then the second track was seven, seven feet from that track. But this is the initial track. You're, you know. Oh, let me see. There we go. Holy you can see smokes. the heel in here. That's the heel. Oh my gosh. But, but there's 
the heel strike, this is a pine forest substrate kind of thing. Actually, you can see that there's pine needles, hemlock, stuff like that. In oh, the, yeah, in the, the stuff is still in it. The the heel here is is at least almost three inches into the dirt. Yeah. It's it's pretty incredible. And then it comes up here. Here you can see the toe, and then it kind of drops back all the foot, you know, the center in here. It's this this like, track is 17 and a half inches long, nine and a half inches wide, and about three and a half, four inches deep. Yeah. That's how that's how big this track was. Yeah. The other track that we took seven feet away was just a small track. And right. this here is basically the push off of the second. So it landed on the ball of its foot mm -hmm. and pushed off. Right. And this is the hump that was that was left. This is where the toes would have been. There's a section of root here that the toes were displayed on. And you could see the toes and they ripped the bark right off the rotting root. But you couldn't cast it. So what I ended up was where, where the toes were attached up to the root bar, uh, up to yeah. the ball of root, and that was it. That's as close as we could get. So this is the, the basically the depression, and why we did both is because we wanted to see that both of them, where am I right here? There. They're the same weight that made the depression is what it is. So right. it was the same creature that did this. It, weighed, it was the same weight. And they're seven feet apart from each other. Incredible. So the first one is... Yeah, the first one, and and you know the casts never do it any justice, and of course us yeah. trying to finagle it, yeah, trying to hold it up any justice. justice. But when I saw that track, it was as clear as day. It was like you hit the lottery. It was just, <laughs> it was in the moss, in the pine. It was everything you wanted in a track. It was right there. And then there was another one. I was like, score! <laughs> but you know the story doesn't stop there. No, no. We didn't have no equipment. We had nothing, we had nothing to catch. You know, we just—I I was so excited just to get them out there to tell them the story that when we got out there, we had nothing. Yeah. So we turned around and we came back. We called a buddy of ours. And we said, "Hey, John, said, yeah. we said John." I said, "I said you're not going to believe this, but there is a track out here." I said, "But we have nothing. You and I, I know you've got all that stuff. So why don't you bring it out?" He goes, "Oh, dude, I'm on my way to a baseball game." He's on the highway. So I he I said, I'm telling you, this is for real. So he turns around, he comes back, he drives all the way out to us. I we're waiting for him at at, at the out on the wood, out on the dirt road. And we get into his truck and we start to drive in. Now I'm in the passenger seat, Tim's sitting behind me, John's driving. We're going in. We couldn't have gotten 50, 60 yards down into down that dirt road. And there was this god awful scream coming from the right hand side up Top on the, the hill, up on the mountain. And it was a definite Yelling, yell, yell, scream. Yep. It was a warning saying, Very you know, in New York. It, here, here come them, here come them dingbats again. Hey, Ryan, you again. again. So, <laughs> so, yeah, that's that's exactly what it sounded like. And it was a roaring. It again. was. It, it was a yeah. wicked roar. I don't know if John heard the roaring because he, he, he had the radio. Yeah, he said he, he heard something, but it was kind of muffled, but he wasn't sure what it was. Yeah, I wasn't sure if he but heard we, it. But you could not miss it. It was, yeah, I mean, it was, it was on our well. side, so we really heard it good. But we still went in. Yeah, so we're driving down the road. We get <laughs> we still down, got in there. Get to the creek, we cross, we walk up. And, yeah. and meanwhile, this thing had roared at us. Already started. They had just had a daytime Class A. A whole bunch of people, and we're just not even yeah. thinking of the possibility of being eaten or taken or any of that. We just got our buckets of casting material. We're going for. We it. got a print. We're yeah. going. There's nothing going. stopping us. Meanwhile, we had taken that print and covered it with bark and things like that, and again made another right. tripod over it so an animal wouldn't we step didn't want on it, it or ruled. interfere or any of that. So we got right back to the spot, <laughs> took everything apart, and there it was. Eric, we all cast the track. Yeah. And we obviously looked for more. We found that second decent yeah. track that, you know, is the push off. And really that, I mean, to see the push off is one thing, but to see the toes on the root, yeah. that it was a rotted root and you couldn't, we just didn't have enough material to cast it, to be honest. It didn't, it didn't cast up into the root. It had to have been a thick, thick cast, but that's, it was pretty amazing. But we got the push off. We got the heel print. It's a fairly decent track of, of what they had seen. You know, I mean, it's a dozen or so people. That's they, five. That's over five and a half pounds of of a uh, dental stone. Yeah, it's it's a lot of material to. to and make I could have cast. used more. Yeah. <laughs> yeah.
but that's what we got out of it. You know, so you had, you know, a that's dozen a people story. looking. You had whistles. Was it whistles and knocks? Whistles, knocks, yeah. claps. Whistles, knocks, class A, multiple, bit, you know, sighting. Yeah, uh, two of us actually saw Witnesses it. to all that. Yeah. You walk away with a track, <laughs> howls, growls, yeah. whatever the hell you want to call yeah, it. Something had to be there. Yeah. So, I mean, that there was, for me, was definitely an, an, an affirmation. This is definitely the deal. And after he actually had seen it, you know, 40 yards away, it's not that, you know, but go ahead and ask him. Did you see anything? Yeah. Nada. Nada. It's just this. No, and I wish I really could get a clear view at what I saw. I know, I know what it wasn't. You know, I know it wasn't deer, moose, and all that, or bear, and all that other stuff. It just wasn't that. It, this thing, it, it, when it teeter tottered with me, that's, it just blew my mind. I was like, what? Yeah, this thing is was this? going like this. That's and crazy. Then it up. <laughs> and when it turned, you know, it turned. That's how I knew how wide it was. I went, oh man, I can't believe this. That that thing is, and we, I just ran at it. <laughs> Instinct with the run. The other place I wanted to get out of there. Yeah. What do you, what do you guys think that is when they're they're doing that that sway back and forth? Is that for some kind of visual aid, visual acuity for them? I think it was doing the same thing I was doing when I leaned over. I would. I, it's like I was trying. It's sort of like peekaboo. You know, I was trying to get a better view. Was what I was doing. Trying to trying to move maybe a leaf or two out of the way or something. I don't know. Yeah, and I think he did the same thing. Yeah, you're looking under the underbrush. And I think he did the same thing. Oh, that whole time. See, I I, I have an, an, an orange marmot rain jacket. So I stuck out like a sore thumb. Everybody else had dark colored rain gear. So I really stuck mm -hmm. out. And when I moved, you know, that's what he was seeing. He was seeing that orange jacket move. Like, holy crap. What's you know? that? So it was like when I moved, he moved. And then when we both stood up and looked at each other, we were like, whoa. No, that wasn't supposed to happen. <laughs> so was there any viable video from that experience? The guy that was in between us, believe it or not, yeah. was standing there. No, he had a tree dead in front of him, and right behind that tree is where that Bigfoot was. Yep, literally, you can see the video <laughs> of the GoPro, and Eric is on one end, and John's on the other, and they're 60 yards, eh, 50 yards from each other, at least. And there are two at different ends of uh, what was, you know, there's plenty of trees and whatnot in front of them. And there was more of an angular yep. to their to their directions. Eric was off on one side and John was off to the other. So it was, you know, at a 90 from where the, the camera was. And you could see when it came into frame that all of a sudden, you know, they're, they're pointing at the same object, the two of them almost simultaneously, far apart, pointing at the same thing. And literally going after it, the both of them, and then and then that, that tree stopped. <laughs> there was some movement, you know, the regular, and that was the extent of it. The guy videotaping the whole thing was videotaping the whole thing, and then there he got to the end, and there, there was a tree right there. Yeah. Isn't that <laughs> about so, how it works? Yeah, yeah, right. And there's a dozen or so people with all yeah. kinds of go go gadget stuff, and nothing, nothing. Yeah, and yeah. Everybody had their phone going. And nobody came up with any, any, and the two gentlemen that were behind us that were coming up to meet us couldn't have been 50 yards away from where this all happened on the same dirt road that this thing ran towards. Yeah. And, and they never even, saw it. It's escape route, he says, was, you know, in that direction. Yeah, just ran right at them and they never even saw it or, or heard it. Mm. They are incredible how they is, get in and out of places like that. Just so quickly, yeah. so silently, if they want to, or they can sound like an yeah. elephant. Just crashing through the brush. That was another thing that we looked for, too. We were looking for broken branches and all this other, nothing. What do you, there was nothing. He, just, he thought there was three of them. In and out. And, they, and you yeah. got in between them? We got the one in the middle. There, I, I believe, I wholeheartedly believe that there were three. That's why there were whistles behind us, knocks in front of us. And the one in the middle didn't dare make a noise because he didn't want to get caught. And I think that's the one that we caught is, is the one that was in the middle. I think they were, they happened to be coming, they were coming through the woods and we were coming in the opposite direction. And that, and we just kind of met face to face. Yeah. 
and you know, it kind of makes sense that there's more of them. Now that I'm kind of thinking out loud, because back in 2016, if there were multiple, we have another encounter with juveniles in the same area, the same location in 2022, where yeah. there were multiple. We believe there were multiple. So maybe there is, you know, maybe this has a, the ability to hold a, a group for a while. You know, I don't know if they're habituating there, or if they, you know, it's a pass through. For us, we believe we look, we do a lot of on the investigative end, you know, methods, technology, stuff like that. We we do a lot of uh, track trap stuff like that. We do, you know, making cameras. track traps, actually going out and making track traps, yeah. cameras. We use a product called Hex. I keep pushing it and I haven't heard from them yet. <laughs> but you know, it, it's a it's hex is a product that blocks your electrical output, your body, your 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 muscles movement, everything is electrical yeah. output, and and some birds, most animals can see this. It's in birds and turkeys in particular. It shows up as a, some sort of a rapid movement. They can somehow see the electrical movement in you, and by wearing this, it reduces your electrical output. So it's just like a Faraday cage you learn. And it's a carbon fiber, you know, cotton clothes. It's nothing fancy. You got a head net, head neck, gloves, stuff like that. And you you put it on to reduce your electrical output. And you can literally get animals coming right up on you. Oh, yeah. Uh, it it certainly works. It's a good product. Simple as that. So the thought was if it's gonna work on me, why not maybe on that? So we take our cameras, we wrap up our camera. You know, a lot of people take uh like we first started you know, we're going to hide them. So we hide them in bark and you dig out a hole for the lens and the, you know, all this stuff. And, and it's hiding, you know, that most hunters won't see it or, or hiker or something like that. Most of them won't see it, but if it's an electrical output, you're going to see the electrical output. It's going to come right through the bark. Like it's coming through your clothes, like anything else. So you to, to reduce that. And the reason why I go there with that thought concept is because everybody talks about at least in the bigfoot world that you know it's very hard to get bigfoot on a game camera they see it they blah 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 there's all kinds of this and that okay fine if it's out there it's out there so why not try to reduce it the camera is an effective tool regardless if i could put a covering on this and it can reduce the output where it doesn't see it or i can happen to yeah, you know, we get a chase scene where it's coming after an animal and you get one running past it by accident. I'm in, I'll take that, you know? So it's all about research and, and what works and what doesn't, you know? And, and we're trying this, this is, it's not mine. Everybody out there should try it, share the ideas, share the information because yeah, what works for you it. might work for me. What doesn't work for me might be, you know, not working for you and we share of it, talk about it, say, let's kick it down the road and move it go to a different thing. But, so right now we're doing the track traps, we're doing other other styles. You get into three of the long-term places that we research. And, and the research is literally that you're going out, you're funneling, you're, 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 make, you're trapping, you're trapping. Why, why, why are you gonna get a Bigfoot to walk in front of your camera or any other animal for that matter? You're building side rails or handrails that are going to, uh, you know, a deer is just going to casually walk along and off the side of the right, you know, they're going to see a, a branch or twigs or a down branch and they're not going to walk through it. They're just going to keep going so they can get around it. Well, if you can keep making these handrails or blockages and force them down an alley or a path, then you have a better chance of guiding or <laughs> bringing it to your yeah. camera. So, you know, if you take the escape routes out and you put in debris, you know, like you're blocking off a trail, these deer, most of the deer won't go through it. Most, and when we're deer hunting, typically that's why we're doing it. So that's the method. And now you add these, these coverings, <laughs> you know, you just might get lucky. And we're not just- I think the covering will at least knock down some of the, elect the electrodes coming off of it because of the batteries. Yeah. I do think it, it'll knock it down. Maybe it'll knock it down enough. Yeah, so it's not picked up. Or we received. won't know until we try it. So and then we put them up high, you know, vertical, so they're yeah, looking down. Angles. You know, so they're you know, if you're walking down, you're not typically looking up into a tree, and that's where this camera will be. And then it's set up over a track trap or a water source or a food source or something else. So there's a you know, why is it going there? It, I, yeah. I, you know, the casual walk by thing is is by chance. Yeah, I want it right. 
There's a reason, we're, you know, we're, we're giving it reasons to show up there. Exactly. You're sure. supplying it with you know, food, water. There's a reason. There's a reason why it's going there. Bedding. You know, they have have they have habits and things like that. Most creatures do. I put this up with the rest of their creatures, and you follow behaviors and patterns. And if you can recognize behaviors or patterns, like we have, like in Bigfooting, we believe our our pattern is they're more they're more apt to be found in in from the summer into the fall. The rest of the time, eh, yeah. you know, summer into the fall. Why? We have harvest season here in New England. I mean, everything from the small backyard farm to the big giant thing that's going to supply your big stores yeah. is right out here. And, and you've got tons of woods. This is miles of greenway that are just connected and connected and connected and connected. You know, my, my place here has got 1,300 acres that goes into a watershed that's got, or a, uh, a reservoir that's got 1,000 acres, another camp that's got, you know, or state forest that's got 20,000, blah, 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 blah. And it's yeah, just it's loaded awesome. with this stuff around here. So you get these random little towns that are dotted, you know, about the war, the woods and, and the forest and the big scope of things. And this thing can come and go as it wants. There's creeks, you know, the, the food sources here, you know. There's plenty of food because they don't have to, you know, they're, they're not just a meat eater. Yeah, trash cans. Yeah, you know, they'll eat anything and everything. But during the fall, there's prime pickings. <laughs> Yeah, it's easy. Yeah. Prime pickings, they got all kinds of gardens and things to go through. Yep. So that's, you know, we get a lot of, we get a lot of sightings during that time. Yeah. And then, you know, we also have kind of equated to our moose. A moose will get 1,200 pounds. Yep. And it'll grow a ginormous rack every single year and lose that rack every single year. But it'll hold 1,200 pounds all through the winter, won't hide or anything like that this thing survives on bark and buds and some grasses and some water grasses right. things like that this is not running around chasing down deer and eating protein <laughs> it's getting its minerals and nutrients from from the vegetation that it needs and it's it's right. showing now granted this thing is designed to be that big but obviously a bigfoot is designed to be that big maybe the intake and the nutrients things are bigger or more meaning you need more meat or something but protein is protein in my book. And you, you can see a moose is designed to, it, it's a huge, huge animal. And they're very intimidating. Bear and they got a rack. Off of it. You know, they, they can grow a rack that they're going to lose every day or every year. And that takes, you know, that that takes, that says something about the uh, the environment that it's in. So I don't necessarily think, a, you know, Bigfoot is going to, I know, I know that everything out here in the woods has to expend energy. And when you expend energy, it costs energy and you have to replace that energy. Otherwise you're going to go hungry or you're going to die or whatever that happens. So, you know, to lose, to be that big and need that kind of caloric intake and, and protein, and that's a lot. That's a lot. And these moose are getting it. So you know, the, the whole hunting thing, I think they're more on opportunist. There could be a symbiotic right. relationship with coyotes or things like that, where they might den up and pack up and go get a, you know, get, get a kill. And, you know, just by hearing the coyotes, you know, giving that victory bark and yelp, oh, hey, that's the dinner bell. So off they go and maybe, you know, steal a, a, a kill or something like that or, you know, a road kill. But I think, to be honest, they're probably more content walking and nibbling as they go. You know, moose in the middle of winter, you'll see that lower jaw on the moose, the teeth rake, rake right up the side of the tree with their teeth. And it'll actually curl the bark up. You can tell when it's a moose because they, they'll rake it right up. Yeah. And, and they'll peel that bark off and get the minerals right out of that. So it's bark and buds, you know, as far as I'm concerned, their diet, that's why you probably don't see a lot of extra bones uh, from deer. If you're a hunter and I'm in Massachusetts, it's not like you go out west and there's miles of wilderness. We right. don't have so much wilderness out here. We got big spaces, but you know, our, when it's hunting season, there's enough hunters out there to find stuff. And 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 you would think that if there was more, a lot of Bigfoot out there eating more deer and stuff like that, that you'd find more carcasses of just deer. Forget the Bigfoot, just deer, and and you don't find that either. You know, you don't. So, and granted, the the woods consumes it all, but. You'd see it. I'm in a. I'm. We're in the woods constantly, and you. I mean, you would just see more stuff, right. predation stuff like that. Coyotes from the main kill site, coyotes dragging it over to a den, or you know, you got parts all over places, stuff like that. 
I just, yeah, it's kind of crazy. Well, no, I, I completely agree on the fact that I think anybody that has any idea on a tactic, just try it. It's worth a shot, right? So that that's just a PSA exactly. for anybody. Nothing is too silly. Nothing is too stupid unless it puts you or the people that you're with in danger, of course. So wh where do you think you guys want to go next? Should we discuss October Mountain or, Tim, maybe the time that you and your wife were escorted out of the woods, you say? Oh, wow, yeah. Oh, there you go. That's, that's a really <laughs> cool story. My wife is deaf in one ear and can't hear her out of the other. I don't know if that's... <laughs> But she, she, uh, you're to, uh, yeah, oh boy, watch it now. She <laughs> no, no, no. She, so she didn't hear a lot of this. So she wasn't aware. At the same time before this, <laughs> it was a mountain lion, but she didn't hear that either. Anyways. <laughs> oh, gosh. Uh, so we, this is another BFRO expedition. This was the same time we had the, we had so, some incidences going off on October Mountain. And we had another group up at the, Blanford Forest there was at Sanderson Brook Falls. And that, the night in Sanderson Brook Falls, we can get to as well, but with my wife, we had gone up after this event had taken place. The event that had taken place was, thought we had some, for lack of a better word, infrasound experiences up there. There was no whoops and knocks or nothing like that. Basically, we were sitting up there on this forest road and it's midnight, one o'clock in the morning. There's five of us sitting on this, literally on the dirt road. There's a cliff on one side and a cliff on the other. So, I mean, it's like up or down, that that's it. And then there's this road cut on the edge. So that that's it. And there's a guardrail on the, um, where you're, there's like, like an overlook and you can see down and see Sanderson Brook Falls. So that's where we parked it. You could see and hear the falls. It was a good spot. We figured we're in far enough, we're gonna park it here. And that's where we parked it. So it's, it's midnight, one o'clock in the morning. And we're sitting there, we're, we're just talking. And next thing you know, you can hear this, what sounded to me like a rock, a large rock rolling down the hill. And mind you, this is more, not cliff, but very, very steep. So whatever's rolling down the hill at this point, it sounds like it's actually coming down the hill. I'm actually on my elbows, on my butt, <laughs> kind of laying back on the ground, you know, just chilling, talking to everybody. And, and when I heard that noise coming down, I swear, I thought I, I couldn't get up fast enough. My feet were all sketching out. I'm trying to get up, get on my feet so I can get out of the way of this rock coming down. And it stopped just, just like that. It just stopped. Never came out of the woods, never did nothing. Just stopped. That was it. So we're all kind of freaking out, looking at us, you know, looking at each other, trying to figure out what that was. Uh, and of course, the obvious thing was it was a rock and it rolled down and hit a tree. It must have stopped. Right? Something like that. That's what you would have thought. That, that's what we kind of pushed it off to so we could sit there the rest of the night without being scared of something else. So we didn't know what it was. It was, it sounded like a big rock. That's what it sounded like. Five, 10 minutes later, we're sitting there talking. Eric is back is, you know, we're on the road. Yeah. Eric's back is to the guardrail. I'm to the one side, Jean, uh, she was on one side and there's another guy, Bob and, and, and Chris. And we're all sitting there and next thing you know, it's just like that, just this solid thud. And it was right behind Eric, right, right behind him. It was like, holy crap, poof, everybody gets up. We're looking back. So what was that? It sounded like to me, if I, it, it sounded like a big rock, huge, hit the side of the, 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 the banking that was there, the bank. So we're going, you know, okay, well, and, and, and this thing is steep. So if anything hit it, yeah. it would have rolled. Yeah. Two things. Or it would have buried. It would have buried it and went in, or it would have had to roll because there was no other option. It's and, that steep. Right. And that's how hard, that's how hard it sounded yeah. like it hit. It hit that hard. Yeah. So we got headlamps and flashlights and we're looking and it's almost a clean shot, just yeah. grass, tall grass, um, some prickers and briars and whatnot down to the to the stream by the bottom of the falls. So you could see all the way down. There was nothing. nothing. No, there was nothing. There was no dent. There was no rock rolling, no flattened no, grass. Nothing moved. Not a, nothing. Crazy. But it sounded like it went <laughs> right behind him and it should have been a rock yeah. buried in the dirt. Nothing. So that, that may have been what we experienced or, or infrasound similar to New York where we could feel it in our chest. 
uh, which I've heard other people talk about. They've witnessed it. We've spoken to witnesses that have experienced it. So it's it's very similar. I don't know how this the reverb gets you, but this was clearly clearly a rock rolling down that hill, and and it was clearly <laughs> something heavy that hit the side of that mountain that night, and there was absolutely zero evidence of it that night. So we you know we go back and we're we're. We go back here, we come back here, here to the camp. We spend the, the night at the camp. The rest of the program is done. And uh, everybody had left. I take off, uh, or rather I go off and I, I get my wife to say, hey, come on, Kim, we're going to go up and check out the, the, the Sanderson Brook Falls. So we're going for a walk. We go up there, we're going for a walk. We get up there and just, we got to the very same spot where the rock, where we were sitting. And we and Kim and I were sitting on the guardrail, kind of just sitting on the guardrail. And and all of a sudden I could hear up in the top, up on the mountain, some rustling. And then it got a little more aggressive, a little more rustling. And I heard tree snap, like like a like breaking, like actual, you know, breaking. It was just kind of weird and it, it was sporadic. It wasn't a consistent thing. It was just a little movement, some breaking, and that was it. And I, I started to notice it was loud. So I said, hey, Kim, let's get out of here. We started to turn around, we walk out and we're going and all of a sudden this noise is following us out of the woods and it's shaking. You can, you can hear it, shaking trees. You, you can hear the, like the twigs, go out and do it in your backyard if you got a sapling. You can hear the twigs, you know, going back and forth with, with this branch or this thing shaking. And so it was definitely shaking stuff, breaking things, all this stuff. And I... This, this went all the way out, all the way out. So it's probably, I don't know, a half a mile, three quarters of a mile, about that yeah, trail. So, yeah. And it stopped at what we call the Stingin Bridge. And that's where Kim and I didn't see it or didn't hear it anything anymore. Um, and that was it. So I'm like, damn, we just got escorted out of the woods. And Kim really, she is, she didn't care about Bigfoot. She didn't know <laughs> nothing about it. She knows plenty of it because I sit home and she has to listen to me. But but, but she's not a, a, a Bigfoot believer at this point. And she still wasn't. So this was going on. And so I grab Eric. I said, hey, let's go up on, the, up on the mountain and find that rock that was rolling. If it stops suddenly, there should be, you know, maybe a tree laying down and it stopped against a tree or the butt of a stump or it, maybe it fell in a root ball. You know, a tree fell over and poof, into a root ball it went. There's a reason. And this noise stopped, and there's a reason why it happened. And we went up and scoured that hillside. We couldn't find anything. And as we're walking back, we come across and find this tree tree twist. And it's a sapling that's probably three inches, yeah, two and a half, three inches around. And it's got a complete twist in a, in a half or so, complete twist. And and I just said, told Eric, we got to take that. <laughs> so I literally pulled the whole thing right out of the ground took it home <laughs> we did <laughs> and then i cut it and i uh, put it on a board i still have it it's it. one of the rooms it's on our powerpoints and stuff like that but anyway we found a tree twist found no tracks found sporadic stuff where the hillside was kicked away loose rock would slide but nothing that track. certainly something was there but but right. you couldn't definitively say it was a squash you know we found the bent trees and not the passive bend slightly arched stuff that you know a lot of snow weight happens on it slowly this was you know aggressively bent where you can see you know aggressively bent meaning that you could see the puckering and the stuff at the at kind of the apex of the bend you can actually see the bark and stuff starting to peel and pucker and wanting to snap but it's just not quite there so it was you know it was definitely something to look at and it was definitely you know that's why I took the the branch home, and now we've got a branch to, yeah, hey, yeah, along with the cast and the twisted branch, yeah. So that was that was the the story on that. That was a pretty neat night at the Blair or up at the Anderson Brook Falls. Now yeah. you guys didn't see what was actually making all that racket and such in that occasion, but you say on Cobble Mountain that you you and and your wife actually did end up yeah. seeing one. Yeah, this is just last year in the summer, and this may have been just under a half mile away. We're I'm, I could probably pick this thing up, I'll probably wreck stuff, but 
if I pick it up and show you out the window, there's a ginormous lake out there. And that shoreline is just about a half a mile away. And I can take and look at that shoreline and I can see ducks going by, I can see kids in canoes or whatever. So it's not that far away when you're looking on the water. And it was July, it was camp time. It was the middle of our, our season anyway, our busy season. And we do what we call a squatch ride. We go off, get a coffee and, and go off for a ride. And it takes a couple of towns to go around the Cobble Mountain watershed. So it might take us 45 minutes to go around the block to literally, I'm on one end of the reservoir to go all the way around. Uh, and it's like a giant turkey track if you look on a map yeah. to go around it. anyways. So we get down to this spot and it's way out in the woods, way out. And it's just a nice little reservoir, plenty of people out there, but you're not allowed out of your car. You can't stop. You, it's, a, it's a watershed since 9-11. Since uh -uh. The right. state police are in there that you just don't stop. You're going to get stopped by the cops and you'll probably get tossed out with a ticket, this, that, and the other thing. So they don't mess around a Cobble Mountain in the watershed area. And it's posted everywhere. You have them, like signs every 50 feet that says no, no trespassing. So to have a, a, a trespasser out there, really dumb. So Kim and I were driving down. We get to this point where Wildcat comes to Cobble Mountain Road and we're overlooking the lake. And right across the lake. We drive around the corner a little bit up near this building and you can see um, this white thing across the lake on the shoreline and it had never been there before. It wasn't a sign or something like that. You know, no, you know, it just wasn't a sign. It had been there two for many years, times. two, three times a week. This is our, our squatch ride. This is our drive-through research. You're know, looking for tracks in the snow and stuff like that. It's a huge area. So we do it in a vehicle, that's all. And it's a scratch ride. So we're going along, going along. And we we have this white thing standing in the middle of what is now, you know, the water and this green landscape against the sky. So there's nothing white about any of it. It was green, gray, black, shadowy, and this large white thing in the middle of in, in the middle of the shoreline. This this thing, so we're stopped and we're parked and we're watching it. And it's not doing much, it's moving, but we can't really see what it's doing because at that far, you couldn't see the details, obviously. But th there was some movement. Next thing you know, it went down. It kind of looked like it bent down for a couple of moments and then it got up, made it turn around maybe, and it walked straight back into the woods. And and that, that was the extent of it, but it was huge. It was huge. It wasn't, you know, like a, a little deer or something like that. And so, you know, I was telling Eric, he said, he said, well, how do you know it wasn't like an albino moose or, you know, a bear or something that was an albino? What we saw was white. So whatever out there wildlife was, it had to have been an albino or a white object. But when this thing, apparently it stood up, it never, it never broadsided. I'll use my phone here. You know, this is what we were looking at, a slender straight image like that. And then all of a sudden, you know, it just kind of disappeared into the woods, just like that. And if it was a moose or a, a deer or something, you'd have that, you know, if he was down there getting his water, he'd take a drink or so, get his water, and then turn around broadside and walk back into the woods. That never happened. We never got the broadside of any, any critter or anything. It was never a broadside shot to show me it was anything other than something vertical that may have spun around, may, may have spun around. I mean, because I couldn't really tell. And and it just simply went back and forth and went right back into the woods. Well, what did Kim and say about this? She didn't know what to think. She didn't know what to think. We're sitting and she goes, well, it's got to be a sign. I said, no, come on, Kim. We, you know, we've been here a gazillion times. There's no sign. She goes, yeah, I know. She goes, well, what about maybe a water tester guy? <laughs> I'm like, okay, so maybe it was a water tester guy, but there's going to be a vehicle down there where we can get to it. And it's going to be on the side of the road. There was no vehicles down there. There was none of that. Water tester guy, maybe he was in a Tyvek suit, maybe, but he would have been huge, you know, to, to put the the two together that and, ball, and that right? thing. It was, yeah, it was just really big. It was just really big, more so to than a, than a man, you know. Did that it's sway just, her any more to the camp of the, the oh, they might be <laughs> oh, out there? Oh, yeah, she absolutely 100% now, yep. 
Yep, she believes it was a Bigfoot. I believe it was a Bigfoot. You know what? It, 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 I don't know what else it could have been, to be honest. You know, I mean, just think about it. If a deer is going to be in the water drinking, it's going to pick its head up and turn broadside to turn around and go back into the woods. That never happened with this this object. This object simply went in, got its drink, stood up. It did stand up and went back into the woods. That's a really cool so sighting, by the way. Tall. Is that area known for these white Bigfoot sightings? Well, there's there's been a number of white Bigfoots around. Yeah. Have, I think Dave, Mc... they didn't see the white one, right? No, but they have reports of, oh, right, right, right. Friends of ours, Dave McCullough and, and John were up there in Quabbin Reservoir. And I believe they had a cup a, a couple man and woman yeah. come up he was a professor at the university or something or something like that and they were talking about a grayish potential bigfoot that they had just encountered up there yeah. and i think dave and the woman john had uh, seen it and and then they john and dave had some sort of, i don't know if it was a whistle or a wolf that happened a long time ago though but but yes there has been a history of of white or gray reports of a bigfoot around here yeah and cobble mountain in its own right <laughs> Yes. Uh, you know, that's our thing is is the Cobble Mountain Critter. You know, Cobble Mountain Critters had a history for since since the inception of the the, the reservoir when people started interacting with you know the environment up here and stuff. And that's when they had the Cobble Mountain Critter and there's numerous sightings up here. Numerous reports. Numerous, yeah. And the whole area, you know, as far as far as not just the, the mountain itself, Cobble Mountain or the reservoir. But everything around it in the watershed, it, it's a very, we got a good area, you know, from quarries yeah. to, to farmland to water to, you know, good, good, just good isolation if they want it, you know. We've had reports from all, all four towns that oh, surround yeah. it. <laughs> so, it, so it is, it is a connection for sure. Cotton mountain critter and it's a couple of them have been white. So, yep. Oh, we I bet. Just, just talking to you guys for this, uh, you know, short amount of time and, and getting to know you guys a little bit. I am sure, Tim, that for this particular sighting, that it just killed you that you couldn't go down there. You couldn't look for tracks. You couldn't, you couldn't do anything. You couldn't see if, if it left anything behind, you know, because you just weren't allowed to go down there. Yeah. And, and that stems from my wife and I. There's an overlook. Prior to this sighting, there's an overlook, probably a month before this. In fact, we ran into the cop yesterday going through there. I told you about it. He was unlocking a gate. So anyway, and the cops are great. Don't don't get me wrong. We love our cops. It, they just have to do their job, and they're going to ticket you if you're in that area. Simple as that. So you play, you pay. Yeah. And, and we know that, so we're not going to do it. We were probably a couple of weeks prior to this, Kim and I were sitting on a, like a roadside where you could see a power line cut and the power line cut, it goes for quite a way. So it's just, you know, kind of, oh, geez, you hope something comes through this power line. We're sitting there checking out the power line, got the binoculars up and whatnot. And, you know, nothing ever happens. It's always fun. It's just a yeah. coffee ride with the life in the woods, you know? And all of a sudden a cop pulls up. What are you doing here? Oh, we're just checking out the view. Keep it moving. Okay, so we just kept on moving. So it's not a place that the cops invite you and stay. So I certainly wasn't going to get out of my vehicle and, and check this out. I, I was pretty certain of what we were seeing because we had talked about it during the ride. Some of the history, some of the lore. No other cars up, up no other yeah, cars up there. No other cars out there. You know. If it was like a sample guy, he didn't go out, get down to the shoreline and back right. that distance. And, and, and there's a half a mile. And maybe. there is no, there is no logging road or fire road no. going off. So, so it's a pretty remote spot. If you look on a map, it's you know pretty pretty remote. There's not a lot of people in the area at all. It's it's in our on the east coast. It's our wilderness area. Just large tracts of right. green space, stuff like that. Uh, accumulated land from property owners. You might go into the. 20,000 acres in that neighborhood of, you know, all the surrounding areas and whatnot. So it's huge, huge properties. Well, you know, state forest. And by the way, heck of a view there out that window. Holy smokes. <laughs> that was impressive. I was not expecting that. You're like, check this out. I'm like, that looks like a painting though. The, wow. It, it, um, it's, 
I I will pretty blessed where I've got where I am. Uh, it's an amazing place, and you know that shoreline is less. It's probably a hundred yards. I just came off the road with my brother from the mailbox, and it's a half mile to the mailbox, and that's probably comes out a little bit more, maybe a hundred yards. So it's maybe just shy of a, a you know half mile, and to have a Bigfoot doing you know. To me, it's clear as day. I could see there's no, I could there's see people walking the over there if they're walking. You know, so, this was a large white object. It certainly changed my wife's mind now. So she's, you know, she's more into talking about it and things like that. That's she cool. won't share about it yet. That's cool. Yeah. Well, they see, you know, that's a that's a positive experience. You know, you have the other kinds of experiences that people go, well, I don't think I want to go in the woods ever again. I'm going to move to the desert. And those are the kinds mm-hmm. of experiences you do not want. OK, so let's talk a little bit for the next round of activity that you have listed here about James Bobo Fay, a wonderful, wonderful person. Hi, Bobo. I love talking to him. Hi, he is a fantastic guy but this next round of activity that we're going to cover has to do with his bobo bigfoot adventure that he had going on at one time so let's talk about that yeah yeah uh that was interesting he was doing a few years ago he was doing his bobs adventures bigfoot adventures and he was going out and around the country and and putting them on and he got a hold of me through john and you know, I have 1,300 acres here to do this with activity. So it was, you know, a far stretch to do something right here. I had cabins. He could have people here. Worked great. So Bob's decided he's going to run one of his adventure programs here. And I'm literally just moving into my house at that point. I believe we were probably here six months, seven months, something like that. So I was still putting my house together. And I didn't have a bow, a, a bed for bow. <laughs> I didn't have a place for him to stay. So I ended up in, in our in our basement downstairs, which is nice. I had the wood stove all set up and a bunch of guitars and a, you know all my mm-hmm. scratch memorabilia and stuff like that down there. And I had to build a bed for, him. and so he would have a place to stay. So I built the bed. He came up and we did this in, in four day investigation light, and we had people from all over the place really all over all over the place they were they, they, I, I don't know if they were Canada and whatnot but whatnot uh, we had plenty of people that came down and um, we ran a, a program we're out there this is in I think it was November and it was windy as oh it was cold it was just windy 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 and cold and it was rough and and that's what we had to deal with wind and cold so we're out there and we're doing our investigating and we were broken into different groups. Prior to this, the second night, some one of the groups that had a, a travel trailer had, had said that their their camper was slapped or, or hit by something at night. There was no sticks, debris, anything like that. So couldn't really verify anything, but that's what they said had happened the following night. You know, we're putting all this together. We're, you know, in this cabin, we're detailing where each group's going to be. Right. And why breaking up into uh, groups. Yeah. So I had a group. Eric had a group. Dave, I don't know if Dave had a group or not. He must have had a group because Dave McCall was with us and there was a few others. And we broke up into different areas and, and just posted for the whole night. And I know in my particular area, I had uh, three ladies and we were sitting out on the edge of a swamp. And... We had something looked like it was climbing a tree and it was well, maybe just under a hundred yards away. Something was moving up and down this tree and we were thinking it was a bear. So it was like, oh God, this isn't good, you know, but something we had, I couldn't tell you what it was, went up and down a tree multiple times and we were just posted up on the backside of the swamp sitting on rocks and we were kind of camouflaged by the bank and sitting up, we had ferns over our head you know, big cinnamon type looking ferns, ostrich ferns. So we were blended right in. And and we're listening to something climbing tree. You hear climb up, slide down and whatnot. Don't know what it was. And, and with customers there, basically, you know, I wasn't going to take them into potential harm's way. So we just posted and listened. And then and then Eric, I, I was I went over to our track trap. I took this husband and wife from Louisiana, I think they were. And we went over to the track trap and we're standing there and it's pitch black. You can't see nothing. 
And all of a sudden you hear a very distinct high pitched whistle. It couldn't, it sounded like it was 30 yards in front of us. So the, the woman, she grabs onto me. I, 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 I went to put the light on and she grabs onto me and, and she's looking and her husband says, what was that? And I says, I said, well, I says, I don't know. I says, it could be a bird. I don't, I, I'm going to see, you know, see if we, if we can see anything. So I turned the light off and there's just standing there. And all of a sudden it was wicked loud. I mean, it was a loud whistle. For a human to do it, it maybe they maybe they could, but there was when I turned that light on, she, when your Nate when he actually came behind me, and and she she was up against me, and and that light went on. She goes, "That's a Bigfoot," and we're looking, and we couldn't see anything, but that whistle was definitely it wasn't a bird. There were there was nothing there, and and, and we stood there for another 10, 15 minutes to see if anything else was going to happen. And the two of them were like, can we go out to, to the big field now? I said, yeah, sure. Come on, we'll go out there. But yeah, that was solid. And then they, I think Bobo was Bobo's way up, up on the top. Yeah. He had a, he had a group up there. He was up on the top. And I think they had things yeah. happen up on top. They did. I believe it was movement. Couldn't yeah. verify anything. But after the whole night, there was multiple movement throughout. And with the hand slaps and whatnot, and yeah, you just put it all together. It. That was really the extent of it. You know, we had, oh, there was a scream. Uh, Kevin Romero was there. We had the recorders going and we were recording. It sounded like, a, it sounded like a, it was actually funny. It was a debate between Bobes and, and Kevin. How do you know that was a girl? Uh, it was, you had to be there. <laughs> so anyways, it was, it was really funny, but there was this loud scream. It possibly could have been like a fox, maybe. You know, sometimes they, they yell out yeah, and it'll sound right. like a, a female, a female but, high pitched sound, maybe. And uh, it said that Bigfoot mimics too. So, it, you know, yeah, it could be anything. Yeah. Yep. It so, really could. And this is just after they had, you know, we had the campfire that night. It was really windy. We had broken down from the campfire and then we had the rest of that activity that night. Right. So it was a, it was a mixture of a bunch of little things that was happening. But certainly everybody walked away with a, a like, hmm, okay, that was that was definitely weird. You know, can we actually say that was a juvenile? But I think Bob's walked away calling it like the Disneyland of big juvenile. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It was just a lot of, he didn't think it was a, a, a adult version of Bigfootery going on. He thought it was like a juvenile situation is how he. Yeah, because of the interactions that we were getting. It could have been the noise, uh, the noise, the tones, things like that. Who knows? Yes. Yeah, either way, we, yeah. either way, it was good. We had action. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah she's going. What's that? You're going. Well, that's what you're here for. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And then we that morning we went down, got breakfast in town, so everybody in town got the meat bulbs, and you know they had no idea it was you know any any of that stuff so we came back here and after that it was almost uneventful we had the excitement right. that night actually a couple nights and and that was the extent of it bulbs went off we yeah. had a positive experience here it's definitely, definitely did, action it was good yes yeah definitely action and we took them off to a bunch of different spots we had a great great time so it was a lot of fun having bulbs out but we certainly had a a positive experience right. which potentially had some bigfoot action yeah so just a few random questions kind of in closing here, because I would like to hear you guys' opinion on some of these. And I kind of referenced this earlier, but have you ever thought or do you worry that you together or separately would have one of quote unquote those encounters that does in fact completely just turn you off from not only Bigfoot research, but it makes you, you know, look, look over your shoulder when you're taking the trash out, that kind of a thing. Do you worry about that? No, I, I, you know, I, to be honest, for me personally, and I've seen it, I, uh, you know, I've never, I, I, I don't know. You know, I guess it would have to be, I. Hasn't kept you out of woods yet. Right. I mean, I want to get in. I, maybe if I got a better look at it or if I had a different interaction with it, if I was by myself, 
that I, I there's a lot of ifs there. Yeah. But I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I enjoy the woods and I enjoy the search. So mm -hmm. And until that day happens, I, I really, that's a tough, that's a tough question. Yeah. It really is. It, it's, it's a <laughs> lot of fun. I mean, I make a living in the woods. I go out my back door and it's 1,300 acres of woods. It could be right there, you know, but so couldn't a bobcat or a bob, a bear or any of the other critters. So I enjoy Bigfooting. I love it. I, you know, the whole thing, we're knowers. We know this thing is out there. Now we just want to get better proof of it. And that's our goal is just to get better proof, yeah. share, share practices, techniques, learn techniques, learn different other people's, you know, what are they doing? What are we not doing? You know, what are, what can we do to better our odds? Things like that. But, but you want to know if it'll keep us out? I, I don't know. I, I, until, until really we have that, that kind of an encounter. I don't think it's going to keep me out of the woods yet. We've had a lot of scary I mean, stuff it didn't keep already. Us out what happened to us in New York? So, yeah. <laughs> and we've had other things happen to us. Yeah. That probably yeah. should have kept us out of the woods. Connecticut, we had rock throwing. Uh, yeah. Came through. You know, something. Long story short, it was a uh, this tree that had fallen down. It was in the summer. Had a full canopy, big oak tree, probably eighty foot canopy around it, all leafed out, just laying horizontally on the ground, mm -hmm. and we had heard something after a day of uh, programming, and uh, actually, I'll just tell you the story. <laughs> it, it's a yeah. Connecticut story. We're in Northwest well. Connecticut. We are working with, at this time, it's our business to come out outdoors, and we're running an outdoor ropes course, which is elements that are up in the trees, wires, yeah, and things like that, course, zip lines, yeah. and, and that kind of confidence building stuff. And we're doing a school group. I won't give any names or groups out, but we have a Catholic school that we're delivering program to. We are on a private mountain at a private school, and they have a huge property, huge property, and the uh, Appalachian Trail abuts it. The Taconic Range into the New York area abuts this area. It's just a whole bunch of woods. Yeah, there's nothing around woods. it, just, just woods, yeah. just a mountain. So this school group shows up. We do our program. We're having dinner. Eric and I... Our, our, our task at this point is to make, uh, we have a grill and we're doing hamburgs, stuff like that for, for dinner. And the school group is either doing a Bible study or they're going somewhere. At this, at this point in this time, they were going to the top of the mountain where right. back in the day, there was an old chimney, an old, they used to just go up there and enjoy the view. So they had a chimney and a small shack, it was a small cabin, probably in the thirties and forties and poof, it burnt down. So now they have this chimney up there. So they go up to the chimney, there's a little clearing and they'll do prayer, worship, Bible study, whatever they're doing and they'll, they're doing it. And then about 45 minutes to an hour later, they're done and they come down the mountain and they come to where we are and we're gonna serve them their supper or their dinner. And, and that's just what we do. Yeah. They went off, did their thing, came down the mountain, it's kind of uninventful, kind of like every other program. And it was, which is good because you don't want any bad right. things or excitement. You know, you just want things to, you want a group to come in and go with no program problem. And that's how you run a program. Exactly. And we're serving dinner and this pre, he's a Bible study, not a preacher per se, but a Bible teacher. He's a, he's a teacher in the school, Bible study. And, and he's, you know, we're sitting here and, doing out the burgers and whatnot. And out of nowhere, this random, what? Four or five seconds, just like that, wicked loud, like a, like a police car on the top of the mountain where they had just came from. And, and we're dumbfounded. This is the first time I've ever heard anything that loud. And I, I'm yeah. looking at Eric, Eric's looking and at me. have been down there for a couple of years now. <laughs> oh yeah, we never heard anything like this other Nothing. than a cop car. That's what it sounded like, and yeah. it was on top of the mountain. There's no road. There's no path. I mean, there's a path to go up to the chimney and back, and that's it. That's it. There's no road. You're in the woods, and there was a police car at the top of this mountain. What it sounded like, and and, and it wasn't. You know, I've been asked the question. Well, maybe it was air uh, raid. Uh, an air raid thing or a fire alarm thing. It, there's nothing up there. 
because I, I asked the same question myself. Yeah, even if a kid went up there with one of those wind up deals, yeah, yeah. you'd hear the wind up. You know, but they, they just came down from there. Nada, nothing. Right. Yeah. This, this wasn't was straight a up in your face, wicked mega loud, beginning to whistle. End. Yep. Start to finish. No, no fluctuations in tone. No. Just what? Straight out. And and that was it. And it probably went four or five seconds. Preacher looks over at us, <laughs> at Bill. And he looks up at Eric, and Eric looks at me, and I'm like, yeah, Bigfoot. Big and you're like foot. shrugging your shoulders like, yep, that, yep. that was it. <laughs> yep. That's what we did. Well, prior to this, of course, we were telling him about, you know, Bigfoot and you know, all this oh, stuff. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, of course, he's not believing us. He ain't going to have any of it. And then all of a sudden, and the whole group is like this. We we share this with everybody. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the whole school group knows that we're, and this school group is 10th graders. They're not, you know, little, yeah, little yeah. kids. These yeah. are 10th graders, and they're going to be camping the night there. <laughs> They're camping that night. It's a two a weekend program. Oh boy! So, yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> this is this is Saturday night, and we they had just finished prayer, come down, and they're they're doing dinner, and they and got this whistle, and then probably so after that they're kind of okay. That was weird. No one verbalized anything. They didn't know what to make of it. It was just well, that was weird. I don't know. Maybe an hour or two later, the owls started going off. And there were multiple owls, and they were, you know, hoo, 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 and they're coming at each other and and like battling. <laughs> and it was it was kind of that's a very unique experience in its own right, having oh, owls yeah. territorial fight or something, and they're they're battling each other, and they're it was wild. And it's, it's just a lot of noise, all right, just a whole bunch of noise. And, and that's uh, just the owls. Yeah, that wasn't including the coyote. But, and then <laughs> you know maybe an hour after the. The, the owls, the coyotes start up and it's going on sundown. It was, we've had dinner now. It's getting, starting yeah, it's to get dark. dark and the coyotes start acting up. And, and it sounded like the coyotes had just received a kill. You know, maybe, right. you know, mom and dad coyote brought it there and all the little kid coyotes are chowing down and they're yipping and having a woo hoo. If you've, right, ever, if you've ever heard a pack of them, they yeah, make, they, they make they a lot of noise. They go off. And that's what this sounded like. Like, some just brought some food back to the den. It was like, yay. Yeah. And there was like a half a dozen of them. And they were yipping and barking and screaming. And, and so the kids are hearing this. And they're the coyotes, I don't know, maybe just a couple hillsides away. Not, not very far at all. And so they're very aware of, okay, we just had, maybe there's something to these wacky guys. <laughs> you know, with the whistling and the, the owls. You know, and I called in the owls, I believe. I was doing a, you know, a bar <laughs> I was doing one of those calls, and then all of a sudden they started coming in. That was it. So they go through that whole night, listen to that, and that night they got really, really, really aggressive, the coyotes. And yeah, they did. Eric sleeps in a hammock. <laughs> I sleep in a tent, and we sleep far apart from each other. And he snores, basically. So he's up there hanging like a taco. And and that's 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 it. He's just the human taco hanging between the trees, waiting for a bear or something to come <laughs> and snack on him. So that that's that's, that's Eric. Always, that's always been a concern. <laughs> <laughs> These dogs got so the the whole environment that night was excited. The owls, the the whistle, the coyotes. It was it very was, it was very exciting. It really was. You you could tell yeah. something what was going on. And then it kind of worked up to this where they ran, were running down the hill right towards our camp and literally right came right through our camp to where it went right literally under his you head. could hear you could hear there were so many of them they were coming down you could hear them hitting the ground yeah. as they're running yeah and all i kept saying was geez please let me be high enough we're all in we're all in our tents <clears throat> this is yeah they're in the tents i'm in the hammock so and i hear them coming and i yelled over to him i says oh my god here they come yeah. And I literally felt that coyote go, or whatever, go right underneath that hammock. And I'm about 30-something inches off the ground. It came right underneath it. You could feel it hit the, on the, I have a down quilt. It hit that down quilt, and it just kept running. I says, oh, man, I can't believe how close that was. I, I says, Tim, I says, here they come. They, they run through camp. Right through. And, and after that, it was uneventful. Finished off our program that morning, sent the group on their way. We were breaking down. I had the Jeep parked over <laughs> to get my tent. 
And I was actually breaking down my tent when we heard something. He looked up at me. I looked up at him and said, did you hear that? And, and we both acknowledged we heard something. And both kind of agreed it was a deer because it was in the morning. It was, you know, daylight. Yeah, wasn't you could expecting hear it kind it. of walking. Uh, there was, was like, something like walking. a hill, and we couldn't see over it. But it sounded like it was just walking, walking by. It was and no it didn't sound like a, you know, thud, thud. Yeah, I didn't really pay yeah. attention, to be honest. We just heard some noise, and we were heading out. And next thing you know, these this rock came flying through the tree, the the canopy of the tree, and you could hear. The, oh, the, yeah. the rock coming through the branches, hitting the branches as it came towards us. And he was he was <laughs> off to one side and it landed maybe 15 feet from him. And that and you could see it, the rock. It was the size of a candle pinball. Yeah. And, and I never even thought of yeah, picking up never the rock even thought DNA. about picking it up and uh, taking it. And there was no kid that was going to throw that rock through that tree. No, it was too heavy and, and too absolutely far. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. So that we believe was a big for throwing a rock at us. Yeah. You know, that whole night You're telling us to get out was was just a a pretty pretty unique experience. It was yeah. certainly everything that happened to us that weekend was a first. Yeah. The whistle was incredible and incredibly loud. The over owl, the years. The coyotes, the whole nine yards. The whole thing was it was great. It was it was an experience that we'll never forget. Yeah. For sure. And neither will those, neither will that group. Yeah. Because they were there. You know, they didn't believe are, it, but I think they do now. I've taken reports on whistles. It's kind of what interests me is because it was a unique experience. You know, everybody hears a lot of stuff. The whistles are kind of unique. This was extremely unique because it sounded like a police car in the middle of the woods, which wasn't there. And a couple of the reports that I've heard that have been told and some of the recordings I've heard online potentially exactly what we heard yeah. or very very very, very similar close to it to what we've heard so we believe it was a whistle and the whistles go from little you know like the tapping in the jubilees right. the tapping in the you know from louisville wood wood, wood knocks you know the louisville slugger to just little baby taps to tapping on trees to yep yeah so yeah, we've had all kinds of things happen that that was the unique one in in connecticut yeah yeah <laughs> eric's over here just ready to take one for the team you know just out in the open mm -hmm. just as you say just uh, wrapped up like a like the eric like burrito yeah <laughs> you know that really got me wondering after that i was like man i don't yeah. know about that <laughs> it's a great way to camp because man it's comfortable but <laughs> Until yeah. yeah, until it's not, and you're getting drug out yeah, of there, exactly. and <laughs> exactly, exactly. All right. So, speaking of proof, do you guys think that they would benefit from being scientifically proven, or do you think that they're doing just fine? I think they're doing just fine. A lot of people say if we prove it that they're going to have hunting season, they're not going to have hunting seasons. They're as elusive today as they are tomorrow. You know. They, they, you might spark some interest. You might scare some people out of the woods. You know, the recreational industry is worth billions. You know, <laughs> yeah. if you start scaring people out of the woods, you know, you're not going to bring billions of people into the woods adding this creature, you know. Now throw in a dog man. <laughs> That's my biggest fear. <laughs> you know, throw in something whack thing like that. And all of a sudden you got to, what, what are we, I, I'm moving. I'm getting out of my woods and going to the city. <laughs> I would agree with that. It's not good to have a dog man around. I will I will definitely second that wholeheartedly. <laughs> All right, so Tim, what about yeah. what about fellow rangers? Do do you guys talk about Bigfoot? Have you ever had a fellow ranger say to you, "Oh my gosh, I, I saw something kind of weird the other day or the other night." Like is that a, th a thing amongst rangers? No, I just have to own it. I have to wear the hat. I no. It's not something that's casual. It's not something that's seen often. I, I think we're very, 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 very fortunate to have as many interactions as we've had. And we've only had them because we've been involved looking. We've been actively looking. You know, it's kind of like, a you know, cops get calls to go to the bad guys. You know, you get a call. Hey, there was a bad guy over here. You got to come. We get a call when there's a Bigfoot. It's or we'd look at a report or a message, and all of a sudden, you know, if it's worth it, we'll take our time, go through the report, and if it's worthy of a drive, you know, out three, four hours, and if you've got tracks or if it's valid for me and Eric to drive yeah, out there, we're there. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'll drop what we're doing, and we're gone, and we'll bring everything we need to to do an investigation. Yeah. But if we're talking 
one track uh, potentially, you know, you need, there's got to be some stuff that captures your attention in the investigative end to make that, you know, commitment to drive out there, spend some money, spend some time, talk to people. And, and in the end, that literally, you know, you kind of weed those out from, from a story to I heard stuff to, you know, we, we primarily focus on people that have, have a class A and that's, or a very, very um, good class B. And a class B is something, a good one is something I would consider, Eric and I have had numerous times now with groups. There's, we're not lying. We've got plenty of witnesses yeah. to say this happened. And, and that's, that's just a fact. There have been times like in Connecticut when we're alone, you know, we're, we're camping, but I mean, that's, well, then there's two of us, I guess, but you know, there's, there's been multiple, you know, people on these outings that have seen or witnessed all these things oh, that yeah. we've talked about. So as far as Rangers go and not so much, I haven't heard anybody talking per se. It's not a topic of things only in the when I bring it up and then they just say, no, don't do that. Don't do that. Right. Don't do that. But you know, but they, it's more for, oh, he's the crazy dude. No, I, I'm totally good with it. You want to call me crazy? That's fine. I'm okay with it. You, once you know, once is. you're a knower, you, you can't unhave these experiences. You've, you've had them. You can explain away what they weren't, but you can't explain what it was. That's, that's pretty, pretty wild. And that opinion. goes, and that goes for everybody that's out there doing investigative work. You know, they've had the same incidences and everything else. It's the same way. You know, they, they, everybody else that's out there doing the same thing we're doing, that they're looking at it the same way we are. I don't think, I think they're better off just being left alone, just letting us do our thing, looking for them. I don't think that science should get one. Yeah, there's some there's some talk here in Massachusetts like big cats. Why don't they recognize or acknowledge big cats are here in, in Massachusetts? Right. And the bottom line is the from what I understand from from people I talk to in fish and wildlife, it's a there is no breeding pairs in Massachusetts. You'll have a wandering one from Montana, Colorado. You'll have a wandering one that, that'll show up, get hit on the highway. And we've had all that, you know, that's why we know they've been out here. We've seen yep. the mountain lion personally. We've actually seen it. We were Ridge Runners, Backcountry Rangers, oh, the Appalachian it. Mountain Club on the Appalachian Trail. We were yeah. working that night and this thing walked right across the road, right in front of us. Right, going. right in front of the, right in front, front of the truck. Couldn't believe it. We were, oh. And we were about maybe a mile and a half from where we were going to pull off to go camping to start our hike. Yeah. So. You know, there's there's the part where there's no breeding things, so they can't say there's a species inhabiting, uh, habituating or whatnot. And then there's the potential for, you know, like out west, they have wilderness designations. You can't build certain things. You know, there's certain designations in towns and, and, and states and whatnot. Now that we bring in a mound line, how do we designate it? Where do we designate it? How does it affect what, what's already out there for wilderness, you know, how, how do you manage something like that to keep it? And, and now you put a Bigfoot into it, you know? So yeah. first off, you're probably asking people that have no clue on, on how to, you know, on the state end on how to manage a Bigfoot. Bigfoot's been doing it fine. They're not gonna, you know, a surge of people aren't gonna go out there and hunt this thing down. There's, there's a surge of people out there now trying to do it. Right. Really good people on, on, on both coasts doing really good work in my book, putting the time and the effort. You yeah. know, some of these guys are- The amount of camping equipment that's out yeah. there right yeah. now, yeah. Just, just trying to get something like that, it's, it's incredible. Yeah. So they're gonna do fine without a designation or, you know, it's kind of cool having a mystery too. Absolutely, exactly. it's way more fun. You know, we, yeah. the people that know, we no. know, now we know, but we're going back for that, that that another experience that's what we want we want a better visual we want a better photograph we want we want better more and more time possibly that's what we're looking for yeah for everybody else they you know that's a mystery that they haven't seen they want to believe they believe they heard something maybe they you know something freaked them out and oh it had to be a bigfoot 
some people we go out with, everything is a Bigfoot, you know, and you got to rein them in and just, whoa, you know, there's a whole, <laughs> there's a whole bunch of stuff out there. It's not everything is a Bigfoot. Yeah, it's what people have to understand. Not every noise is a Bigfoot. Yeah, so I don't think a designation one way or the other is going to make a difference. No. Yeah, I wholeheartedly agree on that one. Well, Tim and Eric, thank you guys so much for coming on with me, and you're welcome back on any time. Please let everybody know, if, if you want, where to find you, if, if you want them to contact you, give out sure. anything that you like for that information. Sure. Go to the page on Facebook, the Vogel Brothers page. You know, smash the like button. Let's know how we're doing. We're doing a lot of stuff, been a lot of podcasts, doing outdoor shows, doing... We, we got... Uh, a couple of things that we're doing locally here as well. Yeah. But you can go on Wild Guide 1 or 2. It's wildguide1 at yahoo.com and contact us there. Best place to get us is on the Facebook, on the Facebook. page, the Vogel Brothers. 